So Ubisoft just released its earnings call and boy oh boy, there's a huge gap in projections versus actual earnings. And this is not to say that Ubisoft is in a downward spiral. It's just to say that they're not living up to their potential in terms of financial gains. And there are a lot of market forces at play which companies need to pay attention to. So once in a while, it's nice to point out some of these things. So let's jump into a short analysis on how Ubisoft can kick the ball rolling to greatness. But first, let me say that my entire analysis might be wrong, but I'm a consumer and I have some knowledge about what a consumer actually does, thinks about and is willing to participate in. And one of the most powerful aspects of being a consumer is understanding how powerful the consumer is. As much as companies feel like they have knowledge of consumers down to a T, Human behavior is still the biggest obstacle for any service-based industry. The moment you master human behavior or the moment you acknowledge that human behavior is bigger than you, then you will build a successful 100-year company. In the case of the gaming industry, human industry is quick to manifest its own actions and its own consequences when corporations allow greed and poor business practices to be the order of the day. When a person feels betrayed, they will be cautious. With the case of Ubisoft, many people have sworn once bitten, twice shy, mostly gamers across the board. So this year, just recently, when the announcement that the Division 2 was a financial disaster for Ubisoft, no one was surprised. No single person was surprised. And we all know why. There are two major reasons as to why this was the case. The first one was this. The Division 1 was the epitome of disastrous execution. And the second one was the Division 2 threw away everything that was good about the Division 1. Simple as that. I could end the video and we would have covered it all. But let's take a look at, you know, some of these things that I'm discussing and we can take an in-depth look and see how these may have played uh, market factors in regard to this particular title. Ghost Recon Breakpoint also probably added to this, but we're going to be looking at that in another video and I'm going to try to do a two part, three part, whatever much video on this topic. So the first thing is the Division 1 was released and its execution was a disaster. Even though it was released to a massive sales success, the game was Ubisoft's number one sold title when it hit the market. It was an RPG shooter that was rubbing shoulders with FIFA that year. That's how you know you've made it when you're rubbing shoulders and you're going neck to neck with the FIFA game. But the game was released in an incomplete state broken mechanics, lack of end game content, and not enough time to support the game as quickly as possible. So years later, we come to find out that the way the Division team or Ubisoft Massive made decisions after the release of the Division 1 was to take some of their resources, some developers or team, to start working on the Division 2. Even though this may have been the business savvy thing to do, players and those who bought the game were disenfranchised, they were dissatisfied. The player counts for the Division 1 dropped drastically. And I think the reason this happened was because there most likely was not a full team supporting this game. Ubisoft loves to make sequels. So the moment they saw this game is selling like hotcake, they probably jumped into the sequel mindset instead of staying to support this game. The big mistake that they made was the Division is not an, an Assassin's Creed game. <laughs> it's a live service game. And so I think because of their slow rolling of content, this definitely threw a bunch of players out of the window. So add those numbers to those who made the vow once beaten twice shy uh, in 2016 and 2015 and 2014 and all the other things that Ubisoft had done in these past few years to push players away. I believe this was evident that players started to wise up to their business practices, which has encouraged or which have in general, uh, you know, seen, I wouldn't say they've encouraged the release of broken titles, slow support for their games after release. And, you know, they're talking about content roadmaps that, you know, are just time consuming and players have to wait for a product that they've already paid for. Now, I think this is one of the factors that did lead to the culmination of the Division 2 being a sales flop. Now, I've seen comments on my channel saying, you know, this dude, you're not in the industry, you don't know how video games are, are made, you're this, you're that. Someone even called me pathetic. But it just made me laugh because my response to these kinds of comments are just all too easy. The solution to any business is meeting the need of a consumer. Go ask anybody, even the people who are billion dollar moguls in the business world, they will tell you that your consumer is always right. 
your consumer holds the chips. And if you wish to get the chips, you have to play on your consumer's terms. Ask CD Projekt Red for guidance on these matters. So first, Ubisoft can always right these wrongs. I'm making this editorial because I believe that Ubisoft can actually change the entire player perspective of their company and come back and bounce back. And I want them to come back and bounce back. That is why I'm making this editorial. I enjoy solving problems or proposing possible solutions to problems. And even though I've never run a multi-billion dollar video game company, I at least see what consumers are feeling like and saying. And this gives me kind of a general idea as to what Ubisoft can start to implement in a very simple fashion, by the way, nothing really complicated in order for consumers to start to change their perception, change their tune and change how they feel to them. The first thing is this Ubisoft can release games in the most polished state ever. So. Let me put it this way. Motley Fool wrote an article just the other day on Ubisoft shares being at like eleven, twelve dollars, uh, whatever the price is, it's going to be fluctuating. I can't say for sure right now. And they said the very first opening of their statement said, even though Ubisoft is accustomed to something along the lines of that, of releasing their games before they are finally finished with bugs and all that, even an investment opinion analysis agency even knows that Ubisoft releases buggy games. And I guarantee you that these guys may not even be playing the games, but they just go ahead and look at the reports. They look at the environment and they see that this is a pattern with Ubisoft in many, many of their games. So imagine if Microsoft or Apple or Dell or Adobe, which are companies who develop user software, all release three broken unpolished software in the space of three years. In the space of three years, any of these, any one of these companies releases three, not one, but three software that they sell to their consumers in a broken state. What do you think will happen to them? What do you think will happen to the consumer confidence? Granted, Ubisoft is a baby compared to these tech giants, but I wonder, wouldn't that be the goal for Ubisoft, who's a small baby participant in the software ecosystem to be proficient in their execution of the product? Like, don't you think Ubisoft will want to benefit from that? Or maybe my analogy is just way out there. Let's look at another company and see someone in the same ecosystem as Ubisoft. Let's look at Activision. Now, even though you can call Activision all kinds of names, you can call them greedy, you can call them all kinds of stuff, it is quite rare in my own experience to see that Activision releases a game with the same level of brokenness that Ubisoft can pull off. I mean, I use Activision as an example because they make their titles somewhat like Ubisoft does, releasing the same games for years and years and years. But the difference is this. Every single Call of Duty game that I've played in terms of the campaign has been polished. So when COD is successful 15, 16 years, even 17, 20, 25 years in a row, I think that this is one of the biggest secrets. It's not really a secret. It's quite obvious. Make a clean, functional product and people are going to buy that product because they want to enjoy that product. Microtransactions, in-game purchases, these are vices. But even though you decide not to purchase any of them, you can still have a polished experience if you participate in that game. And then if you even look at Ghost Recon Breakpoints, which I tried not to put in this video, but it just had to come out because it's the most recent, it lacked polish. I mean, the Division 2, yes, had bugs initially, but nothing to the level of what a lot of people had reported with Ghost Recon Breakpoint. This by itself has been the song of Ubisoft games annually. There's got to be one or two bugs to the point where you just always have to say, you know what, I'm going into this game and I think it's going to be buggy and you'll be mostly right. So I think if Ubisoft can fix this issue, they'll be on their way to greatness in no time. You know, just last year, around this season, their, their stock prices were actually double what it is right now. I mean, they were in a good place and I guess they don't know yet because they're still a young company. They don't realize that you cannot build a 100 year company on publishing broken software. I mean, I compared Ubisoft to Microsoft, uh, in, but if anything, Ubisoft being the baby should learn from the mistakes that Microsoft has made. I mean, Microsoft is not perfect. And when I say Microsoft, I'm talking their enterprise uh, and huge consumer level products. I'm not talking about like the Xbox gaming ecosystem. I'm talking about like their Windows. If you look at Microsoft history, when Windows Vista was released, it was one of their 
not so great operating systems. When they learned when Windows 8 was released, it was also not their greatest uh, operating system. But Windows 10, you know, was a big improvement. I'm not saying the software is perfect, but it was an it was an improvement, and they turned it into a service so that they can fix things. I know some other fixes absolutely throw things off, but we can jump into that later on. But largely, your operating system is going to be working as good as an operating system should work in the Microsoft ecosystem. I mean, we can talk about iOS and all that, which runs more smooth and all that, but let's move on to something else. So in today's world, your business model cannot be based on unrefined product launches. It's the same as building your house on sand. It's very simple. And so if Ubisoft can make clean and polished games, they are definitely going to do well. And then the second reason that I placed here for Division 2 being a financial failure is that you have to go into the fact of the ecosystem into the ecosystem of the game to actually realize this now when the division was first released a massive success someone decided it was wise to take a team of developers and start working on a second ip because they wanted to leverage the financial success of the division to make a sequel which is something ubisoft is quite accustomed to so one of the things that i would say to that is that was a critical error because in hindsight, you look at it that The Division was a live service game. And in an ideal world, when a live service game comes out and a live service game is not in the place that it needs to be, I believe that it's the company's responsibility to have all hands on deck to start solving the issues as quickly as possible. And the issues were prevalent. The issues were given to them on a platter. Say, here is the feedback. We want to work with you guys. That's what the community said. A lot of the community said, hey, Here's what you guys need to do. Add end game content. Do something. Replicate the mission. Ubisoft is actually very, very good at creating content in a stream, in a developer stream one time. Let me give you guys an example. An Ubisoft environment designer, level designer, took a mission from the Division 1 and converted the entire mission area, the entire level area in, in a stream and converted the faction that was going to be in that place in one two hour stream you, the talent that this company has is amazing and so for them to be able to say well you know we're going to be taking our time we're going to take two three months to launch you know content for the community i think is just absolutely berserk now there might be other things that have to go into that but i feel like if they have all hands on deck with the goal to fix the things that are happening, I feel like this would have cultivated a bigger community and allow for the Division 1 to be a solid lasting entry. And perhaps maybe it would have been able to migrate to a free to play model with content updates within a thriving community, which is something that Destiny is doing currently. But instead, that slow repair of the IP with many patches saw gamers just leave and never return over the two plus years, which just left a very small and central core community who stuck with the game. Looking back, I can clearly, clearly see that these decisions will come back to haunt Ubisoft. Now, then we didn't know, no one knew, but if Ubisoft had just done right by the community, I think it would have been a different place today. Now, The Division only had a small community remaining. Most of those who left, they said, nah, I'll never go back to an Ubisoft game. I'll never go back to The Division. And The Division 2 was faced with a dilemma. This is what I think. This is my opinion coming in. I think this dilemma was, should we cater to the core community or the old community? Or should we go out and shop for a new community? And I think this was a crossroad for the Division 2 to have been able to redeem itself. Instead of engaging its core community, appealing to its existing community, I think they took the more difficult route and decided to go after a new community, which is why we have the game we do now, where the most enjoyable and complicated aspects of the Division 1, which made it fun, were cut out. The skill tree from the Division 1 had uh, or still has, it's still an active game, has a very clear vision of what an RPG shooter set in urban futuristic world should be like. Conversely, on the other hand, otherwise, the Division 2 has focused more on a realistic depiction of this whole lore. And I'm sure they found the militaristic style to be incompatible when they started to put things in place. And I think it was probably more of a difficult task, or maybe it was an easy task. And so the division, you know, just pretty much got made to be a not so fun experience. And now you fast forward a, a few weeks into the game, the core community that was left was with a product that seemed very foreign to them. And then it was discovered at the end of the game that some of the end game content was not ready at launch. 
aka Tidal Basin. And that just started to make confidence shake. It seemed like we had found ourselves in another spiral cycle. And then as the dissatisfaction began to grow, another mass exodus happened again because by the time they wanted to release this new content, they made a very critical error of nerfing and changing aspects of the game that players were already used to, which is a big aspect to how they actually balance their game. They need to balance it once and then every other thing needs to fit into that balance scale. So let me, uh, let me make a small chart for you and pretty much show you what this drift looks like. So I have a chart here with four different tables. One of them says core community, the other outsiders, developers, and the consequence. So the core community always enjoyed the skills, but a lot of the outsiders were people who were testing and trying out the game, always thought the skills were kind of weird. They thought it was complex. And so what did the developers do in the terms of Division 2's development? They slashed the skills, they made them weak. And then the core, core community, especially a lot of the skill power players, they threw in the towel and said, this game is not for us. We're not used to not having our skills be able to do good work. And this was a consequence. A lot of players dropped the game. Now, the developers went back and made skills way strong, being as a response to a lot of the community being dissatisfied with that decision. So that was, in my opinion, a poor decision because if they had to revert that decision and the decision has not resounded well with the community then that's what we have to rate it as the next one was medkits the division community enjoyed the medkits they were like oh medkits are great and then a lot of the outsiders may have you know uh, wondered and said medkits are just unrealistic because you could pop a medkit and go straight to full health if you timed it right in a division one which is something that you you know required some skill and knowledge and awareness to do and so what the developers had to do was let's just make the medkit healing system more realistic where you have like a three four second animation in order for you to repair your health well the core community could not stand that so they went back to division one to play pvp which they were used to and they had been accustomed to the other aspect too is the core community was like you know tough enemies are challenging we want more challenging content and the outsider community people who the developers were probably trying to appeal to came out and said you know enemies feel like they're bullet sponges and so what did they do they reduced the time to kill in pve and now a lot of the community is saying that the game is too easy and i think the developers are most likely going to up the difficulty in order to actually make up for the amount of ease that we currently have right now we're in title update six players are so strong and if anything has to actually deter that strength and for them to appeal to the core community they might have to increase the difficulty but if they don't i think the game's in a fine place that's just a tiny little aspect another thing too that the core community enjoyed was builds builds were fun they were challenging to make a lot of the outsider community and people like all the outsider community people who were just testing the waters with the game people who never really invested into the game their own complaint was that builds were confusing well the developers went ahead and made builds generic all the builds pretty much from everything before title update six was the same build you either were building in three different paradigms and that was it and then what the community found out was if all the gear is the same and you can slap on any you know six items loot is pointless and so the developers had to quickly make that change and introduce a loot diversity system which we see in title update 6 right now so the generic build making or the limitation of builds was a very poor decision and then the final thing i'll discuss in terms of this is that the pvp aspect a lot of the core community were, was all about the pvp requiring a huge skill gap well a lot of the outsider community they had the other opinion that pvp was toxic well if you go to any game people pvp there's usually toxicity people always want to mouth off and that i think is just part of the game well what the developers did was they turned up the voip they split the dark zone into three remove signature skills and remove a lot of the things that helped you stay alive in pvp like the support station they removed the critical hit uh, builds now they've been reintroduced but once they made these changes the pvp community exited including seeing division's biggest content creator move to destiny 2. these are just some of the simple yet daunting aspects to be uh, to being you know new to the rpg looter shooter genre and ubisoft i think is learning these intricacies because now i just think that ubisoft is going to try to revive its core community there's nowhere else it can go 
because right now with the TU6 drop and the hints toward the PvP changes such as movement mechanics seem to indicate that they are now coming back for their core community. And I predict that our return to New York City will be a big step in reintroducing the core mechanics which were taken away from DC. Which is ironic because DC, in my opinion, should have just been an addition to the very first game. The lore would have allowed for it if it was sold under the guise of, well, the technology in DC is quite different from the available technology in New York. That would have been a simple solution. So if you loaded your game and you loaded the map of DC, well, you'd be dealing with Fenris, you'd be dealing with Sokolov, you'd be dealing with Petrov in terms of your brand sets. And when you loaded the game as in New York, then you'd be dealing with Hunter's Faith and Striker. And I think this would have provided more depth to the game. At least it would have provided so much depth that the community would have been able to enjoy and people who were coming into the systems would have been happy to engage into something that is much deeper than even Destiny's entire system. Because if you combine both ecosystems, it will be explosive in how diverse this is and allow for a huge, huge MMO style game that people in the gaming community were willing to at least look at. So if you look at Destiny even, Destiny does use the solar system for its lore premise. I mean, Ubisoft would have had to leverage, you know, this lore and building a dynamic world uh, with so much in-depth mechanics and the community would have just been absolutely ecstatic and you would have actually started to see things like you know the community asking for different maps uh different cities and you know where you can actually go into each city and each city will have its own set of paradigms its own build structure its own technology in terms of trying to take back the globe from the big huge green virus that had actually hit it so here's my prediction, and if you've made it far enough into this video, then, you know, thank you very much. But my prediction is this. I think that Ubisoft is going to bring, or Massive is going to bring back New York in its original state. I think when you get to New York, you're going to get there without any gear. This is my thinking, my feeling. Um, you're going to get there without any gear, and you're going to start looting gear. Um, you're going to have the base of operations. I think if they, if they decide to expand a New York map, which I think is their, is their only option right now, they have to bring the community back. So this is how I feel like it needs to play out. It may not play out this way, but if they really want to bring their core community back and they want to sell that expansion, this is exactly what they need to do. They need to have you arrive in DC, have no gear, just gray level gear. And once you open your first chest, in terms of looking for gear, depending on what level you are, maybe gear score 500, you need to see old division gear sets. You need to see sentries call. You need to see all those things. You need to make your way to the base of operations, the post office, and perhaps maybe even through the dark zone in order for you to unlock a dark zone gate so that they know that the old dark zone map is actually prevalent there, is actually existing there for the PvP players. That will be their, hey, we got you guys here in PvP. You make your way through, go to the base of operations, you're given a mandate, you're giving missions, and you start to take out missions to open up the New York map again. There is nothing wrong in having two major maps in the United States for the Division 2. If anything, I feel the Division 2's expansion should be based on location, missions, world design, and being able to capture like a global scale of these agents working to actually take back everything from the bad guys. That's what I think the Division 2's vision should be. The Division 1 should have had this vision, and a lot of the community actually suggested that this should be the case. But the developers being stubborn did not listen. They always want to go with their vision, and they forget that they're making a vision for a consumer base who holds the chips. So once again, it's not a pride thing. It's not like we're sitting here with a chip on our shoulder. We just happen to be the people who call the shots for how the game should proceed. And I feel like if Ubisoft wants to be successful, if they want to increase their market capital, they have to listen and follow what their community is actually hinting towards and desiring. Now, solutions, they could take a lot of their teams that gather feedback and start to take feedback from everywhere. Feedback from a uh, comment section on YouTube. I know they, they depend on Reddit and depend on their forums, but they need to go out there and get the information. Trust me, if somebody wants to put their their feedback somewhere that's valuable to you, you're the one in need of that feedback. If they don't put it on the Ubisoft forum and you say, well, it's not an Ubisoft forum, then we can't take it seriously, you're at a loss. 
people actually knock on doors to get feedback to, in order to get some data because some data you just cannot get from gleaning from one source. Now, I'm not saying they're not doing these things, but I say they need to double down on these things. They need to make sure that they're taking these feedback into, into consideration in order for them to start developing what they need to do in order to bring players back because they can still bring players back to the division game i am very very convinced of this and if they're not convinced of this then they shouldn't be working on video games video games is about dreaming video games is about having a strong vision and just having a lot of hope and belief that your product is going to do well and even in the face of your product not doing well you still have to still keep hoping and pressing on you got to have resilience. If you don't, what are you doing in a cutthroat industry that is definitely, you know, not nothing is, is sure in, in the video game industry? You know, somebody can make a video and say your game is bad and that would affect 100,000 people making a purchase decision. So you have as the developers, you as the leaders in, in massive Ubisoft, you need to continue to press on and you need to find out what the develop the the community actually enjoyed and bring those things back to the game every single day. And if Ubisoft does this, they are on their way to greatness. And this is just one title. We'll look at some other titles and we'll talk about this in a much more uh, in-depth context in a separate video. So thank you very much for watching the video. Thank you for taking the time to actually go through this whole content. I don't even know who would have made it to the end, but I appreciate you so much. And I guess I'll see you in the next video. Peace.